The cocktail party problem exemplifies the challenges of real-world auditory attention. And in this talk, we're going to show you our work toward building models that can attend on par with human listeners. To build our models, we operationalize word recognition as an attentional selection task. Task goes something like this. First, we play an example of our target talker as a cue, and this cue is going to indicate the voice and location of the target within a spatialized mixture. We then play a mixture that contains the same target, now saying new words, along with distractor talkers and natural noises, each at different locations. The task objective is going to be to report the middle word said by the cued talker in the mixture. Correctly performing this task requires attentional selection based on the voice and spatial location of the target. To build models that can solve this task, we take inspiration from neuroscience, particularly evidence of attention acting as a feature-based gain. Here, attention is seen as a multiplicative scaling of neural activity based on the features currently being attended to. To build models of feature-based attention, we turn to deep learning. The idea is to learn functions that take in attended features and return corresponding attentional gains, such that Attended features with high activations give us high gains, and unattended features with low activations give us low gains. We do this by parameterizing a sigmoid function. Now, these parameters are going to let a model learn which features to pick and how strongly to weight them to solve our selective listening task. We equip these gain functions to a standard model of the feedforward auditory system. These gain functions occur between every layer in the network, attenuating the model representations as they pass through the hierarchy. Now, the gain values themselves are obtained as a function of our cue signals that have been passed through the same auditory model. Now, in training, the parameters for the gain functions and auditory model are jointly optimized to support the word recognition task. For our first question, we're going to ask if models can learn human-like attention. To do this, we're going to evaluate the models on new stimuli and compare them to a population of humans run on the same experiment as a benchmark. Now we collect a large sample of participants across a range of distractor conditions presented at various SNRs. Now the human results are consistent with prior work. When simulating the same experiment on our models, we see it can recognize speech in the presence of distractors, and it does so quite comparably to humans. Also, we see that the settings that are hard for humans are hard for the model, and that the model explains a great deal of the variance in the human performance within this experiment. Now, human attention is not perfect, and so we can ask if our models make similar attentional errors as humans. To do this, we're going to reevaluate the trials where we played one distractor along with our target and measure the number of times the distractor word was reported instead. When putting the model and humans on the same axis, we see both make these distractor reports about on par with each other at an overall low incidence rate. Put together, we can see our model of feature-based attention attends similarly to humans and explains much of the variance in human attentional accuracy and errors. Next, we're going to ask if our models learn to direct attention in space. To do this, we're going to test for spatial release from masking using the word recognition task. In this test, we're going to position a target at the midline and azimuth, then we're going to flank that target with distractors symmetrically on either side. Then, we're going to measure thresholds by varying the signal-to-noise ratio between the target and distractor signal. Here, the threshold for a given azimuth condition is going to be determined as the signal-to-noise ratio that gives us chance performance on the word recognition task. When compared to existing human data, we see our models learn spatial release from masking in a way that's quite similar to humans. Now, the human thresholds are known to improve with spatial separation, and particularly have a large benefit with just a small separation in azimuth, about 10 degrees. Now, looking at our model, we see the trend is overall quite similar in terms of its dynamic range and shape of the tuning curve, but we see a, a very comparable benefit with the same small step size of 10 degrees. For our final analysis, we're going to ask how the strength of attention varies across the stages within their model. To do this, we're going to obtain the output representations of a single talker, let's say the target, and a mixture from each layer. And then we're going to compare those representations. Now we can do the same thing for the distractor voice. The point here is that a given set of correlations is going to be high 
if the mixture and single talker representations share information. In this analysis, there are a few possible outcomes. In the first, we would see a difference in the correlations at the early layers. This would imply that task-relevant information is removed at the model's early processing stages. Alternatively, we could see a difference in correlations emerge only at the deeper layers, and this would imply the model can only selectively attend once higher-order representations have been obtained. Now what we see in our model is a pattern of late selection. The mixture activations are more correlated with the target only at the later layers, reminiscent of what's seen in humans. Now, we don't constrain how attention is deployed in the model. In this case, late selection emerges just as a consequence of task optimization. To summarize, I've shown you that models of feature-based attention learn to attend on par with humans in speech-on-speech -speech settings and explain much of the variance in human accuracy and errors. I've shown you they also learn spatial release from masking that's on par with humans without an explicit localization objective in training. And finally, I've shown you they learn a late selection strategy just as a consequence of task optimization. In closing, we introduce a framework for modeling human selective listening. We've shown you these models can learn human-like attentional selection in both dyadic and spatial settings. Taken together, these results provide a hypothesis for how attention might be expected to work in the brain given the constraints of the human auditory system and real-world task demands. For future work, we would like to extend the model, for example, to predict the successes and failures of human selective listening, to assess the impacts of hearing impairment on attentional selection, and finally to explore further aspects of attentional listening, including listening effort and the deployment of attention. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators, supporting institutions, and our funding sources. I can pause here for questions.